Okay, so today we are going to start talking about bone. And we know that bone is a type of tissue. It is a connective tissue, right? And osteology is the study of bone. Our skeletal system is composed of bone, cartilage, and ligaments. And it forms a strong, flexible framework for our body. Cartilage, we're going to find out, is the forerunner of most of our bones. And it also covers many joint surfaces of our mature bones. Ligaments hold bones together at the joints and tendons attach muscle to bone. So, our skeleton provides us with many, many functions. And obviously, we could not live without it. It supports, meaning that it holds the body upright. It supports our muscles, and our mandible and maxilla support our teeth. It provides protection to our brain, our spinal cord, our heart, and our lungs. I mean, basically, it protects all the soft things inside. It functions in movement. It allows our limbs to move. It allows for breathing and for action of muscle on our bones, to move our bones. It deals with electrolyte balance, meaning it helps regulate our calcium and phosphate, the amount in our blood through either decomposing bone or building bone. We'll learn about that in a little bit. It deals with acid base balance. It buffers the blood against excessive pH changes by absorbing or releasing alkaline phosphate and carbonate salts. And it functions in blood formation. Red bone marrow is the major producer of blood cells, including all the cells of the immune system. So many functions. Okay, so bones and osseous tissue. Bone is osseous tissue. It is a connective tissue with the matrix that is hardened by calcium phosphate and other minerals. And the words mineralization or calcification is the hardening process of bone. Individual bones consist of bone tissue, bone marrow, cartilage, adipose tissue, nervous tissue, and fibrous connective tissue. So it's more than just bone tissue that make up a bone. Bone continually remodels itself and interacts physiologically with all the other organ systems of the body. Sometimes you might think of a bone as just being static, but it's really not. It is a living tissue that is constantly changing. It is permeated with nerves and blood vessels, which attest to its sensitivity and metabolic activity. There are different shapes of bones. They can be categorized depending on their characteristics. So we have long bones, we have short bones, we have flat bones, and we have irregular bones. Long bones, they are the most important bones in body movement. They are our limbs, meaning they are the humerus and the radius and the ulna of the arm and the forearm. And they are the femur and the tibia and the fibula of the thigh and the leg. They are longer than they are wide and they are rigid levers acted upon by muscles. So they they deal with our movement, right? The movement of your arms and your legs. Then we have short bones. They are usually found in the wrists and the ankles, and there's about 30 of them. They are equal in length and width, and they glide across one another in multiple directions. They are things like your carpals of your wrist 
and your tarsals of your ankles. There are flat bones. They are thin curved plates and they are such things as your parietal bones that form the dome of your head. They are seen in the sternum, which is the breastbone, and they are your scapula of your shoulder blade, your ribs, and your hip bones. They basically protect soft organs and they are curved but wide and thin, hence the name flat. And then we have irregular bones, and they basically don't fit into any category, so they've been put into their own, which is called irregular. <laughs> so they are things like your vertebrae and your sphenoid and your ethnoid bones that are in your skull. And there are some pictures showing you an example of each. Some general features of bone. Well, you have compact or dense bone, which is the outer shell of long bone. You have a diaphysis, which is the shaft, that is the cylinder of compact bone that provides leverage. You have a medullary cavity, which is the marrow cavity. This is the inside space of the diaphysis of a long bone that contains bone marrow. You have an ephesus, which is an enlarged end of the long bone. These are kind of the knobs at the ends of the long bone. And they are enlarged to strengthen the joint and attachment of ligaments and tendons. You have spongy bone, which is covered by a more durable compact bone. Your skeleton is about three-fourths compact and one-fourth spongy by weight. Spongy bone is found in the ends of the long bones and the middle of almost all other bones. And it looks kind of like a honeycomb. You have articular cartilage, which is a layer of hyaline cartilage that covers the joint surface where one bone meets another. And this allows for joints to move freely without friction. Because if you have bone rubbing on bone, which can happen if you lose your cartilage, it's painful, so the cartilage allows for more flexibility. And then you have a nutrient formina, which are minute holes in the bone surface that allows for blood vessels to penetrate. We have a periosteum, which is the external sheath that covers bone except for where there is articular cartilage. And the outer layer is collagen, it is a fibrous layer. And the inner layer is an osteogenic layer that contains bone forming cells. You have an endosteum, which is a thin layer of reticular connective tissue lining the marrow cavity. And this has cells that dissolve osseous tissue and others that deposit it. You also have an epithelial plate or a growth plate, which is an area of hyaline cartilage that separates the marrow spaces of the ephesus and diaphysis. This area enables growth in length. And in adults, you see what's called an epithelial line. And that basically marks where the growth plate used to be and signifies the growth that growth in length no longer can happen. So once we are, reach a certain age, we do not possess the ability for our bones to grow in length. And then your epithelial plate turns into an epithelial line. So here is a picture of a long bone with all the things I've just mentioned. So again, you see the spongy at the tips, you see the medullary cavity in the middle, there's your shaft, your heads, um, there's the cartilage on the bottom and the top, which would be where it would connect to another bone for a joint. Everything we mentioned is there. You even see the epithelial line at the bottom there of the one, of both actually. Then we have a flat bone, 
Uh, this is made a little differently. It's more like a sandwich, sandwich-like construction where you have the spongy in the middle and the, boat, the compact on the outsides. Okay, and then there's something called a dipole and that is the spongy layer in the cranium. And that, it basically absorbs shock and it allows, I mean, if, if you've ever hit your head, you hopefully haven't cracked your, your cranium, your skull, but that is because of this middle spongy layer that does kind of absorb the impact if needed. Okay. So we need to talk about the cells that are associated with bone, the bone cells. Okay, so there are four main types, osteogenic, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Osteogenic, the osteoprogenerator cells, are the stem cells found in the endosteum, the periosteum, and in the central canals. They arise from the embryonic mesenchymal cells and they multiply continuously to produce new osteoblasts. So they're kind of step one. There you have a picture of an osteogenic cell, which will later become an osteoblast, and then an osteocyte. An osteoblast is a bone forming cell. They line up as a single layer of cells under the endosteum and the periosteum. They are non-mitotic, which means they do not reproduce. They come from the osteogenic cells. They synthesize soft organic matter of the matrix, which then hardens by mineral deposition. Stress or fracture, fractures will stimulate osteogenic cells to multiply more rapidly and increase the number of osteocytes to reinforce or rebuild bone. Because as we just said, they cannot um, basically reproduce themselves. They secrete osteocalcin, which is thought to be a structural protein of bone. And this can stimulate insulin secretion of the pancreas, and it also can increase insulin sensitivity in adipocytes, which will limit the growth of adipose tissue. Then we have osteocytes. These are former osteoblasts that have become trapped in the matrix in which they are deposited. They have several different structures. Lacunae are tiny cavities where these osteocytes reside. And there are canaliculi, which are little channels that connect the lacunae. There are also little cytoplasmic processes that reach into each caniculi. Some osteocytes will reabsorb bone matrix while others will deposit it. And they basically contribute to the homeostatic mechanism of bone density and calcium and phosphate ions. When stressed, they will produce biochemical signals that regulate bone remodeling. Then we have something called osteoclasts. These are bone dissolving cells that are found on the bone surface. They develop from the same bone marrow that stem cells give rise to with the blood cells. They usually are large cells formed from the fusion of several stem cells, and they have a different origin from the rest of the bone cells. They have a ruffled border and several deep infoldings of the plasma membrane, which helps increase the surface area and resorption efficiency. 
There are things called resorption bays, which are pits on the surface of bone where the osteoclasts reside. And remodeling results from combined action of the bone dissolving osteoclasts and the bone depositing osteoblasts. So two key words sound very similar. Osteoblasts, form bone, osteoclasts, dissolve bone. The matrix. <laughs> the matrix of osseous tissue is, by dry weight, about one-third organic and two-thirds inorganic matter. The organic matter is synthesized by osteoblasts. This is collagen, carbohydrate and protein complexes, such as glycosin aminoglycans, protoglycans, and glycoproteins. We also have inorganic matter, which is basically um, crystallized calcium phosphate salt and calcium carbonate, along with a few other minor minerals such as fluoride, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. Because our bones are strong, but they are also flexible and can take, um, can absorb shock. You know, they don't just shatter. So they're composed of many different things that work together to make them not, not only strong, but flexible. So it is a composite. So that's what it's saying here. It's, it's like two structural materials, a ceramic and a polymer. So they each, each thing works in its own way. Some things help make it really strong and some things help make it flexible. Um, there is something called rickets, which causes soft bones, and that is due to a deficiency of calcium salts. There is also something called osteogenesis imperfecta, which is sometimes called brittle bone disease, and this causes excessively brittle bones due to a lack of protein or collagen. So again, they're hard but flexible. You don't want them soft or brittle, right? You want them just right. So compact bone. We have a lot going on in our compact bone. We have what's called an osteon or a haversian system. And this is the basic structural unit of compact bone. It is formed by a central canal and its concentric lamella connected to one another by canaliculi. A cylinder of tissue around a central canal and what we call Volkmann or peripherating canals, <clears throat> which are transverse or diagonal passages along the length of the osteon. There are collagen fibers that basically corkscrew or swirl, if you will, down the matrix of the lamella, giving it a helical arrangement. You also have blood flow. The skeleton receives about half a liter of blood per minute. You have what's called a nutrient formina on the surface of the bone tissue that allow blood vessels and nerves to then enter the bone. This opens into the peripherating canals that cross the matrix and feed into the central canals. The innermost osteocytes near the central canal receive nutrients and pass them along through their gap junction to neighboring osteocytes. They also receive waste from their neighbors and transfer them to the central canal, maintaining a two-way flow of nutrients and waste. But not all the matrix is organized into osteons. You also have a circumferential lamellae, which is the inner and outer boundaries of dense bone and this runs parallel to the bone surface. You also have interstitial lamellae, which remains, 
which are the remains of old osteons that broke down as bone grew and remodeled itself. Here is a picture showing those items. Okay, so everything I just mentioned is now on this picture. So you can kind of see, as we've mentioned, bone tissue is a living thing. It is constantly in flux. It's constantly building, uh, dissolving, rebuilding. It's sharing nutrients. It's taking away waste. Um, you know, it's, it's a living tissue, and there is a lot going on inside it. Then we have spongy bone, which literally looks like a sponge, or sometimes people say like a honeycomb. It has open spaces within it. There are few osteons and no central canals. So all, this, all the osteocytes are close to the bone marrow. And it has a couple different things than the compact bone. It has slivers of bones that look like spines, so they are called spicules and it has thin plates of bone called trabeculi. It also has spaces filled with red bone marrow. It provides great strength with minimal weight, and it allows for lines of stress. Um, trabeculi form where, where, wherever we see um, these lines of stress, and that is a a part of spongy bone and what it does, part of its function. So here is a picture of spongy bone. Again, it is covered by compact bone. And here we're going to talk about bone marrow. Bone marrow is a general term for soft tissue that occupies the marrow cavity of a long bone and the small spaces amid the trabeculi of spongy bone. We have red marrow and we have yellow marrow. Red marrow is myeloid tissue and it is in nearly every bone within a child. Hemopoietic tissue produces blood cells and is composed of multiple tissues in a delicate but intricate arrangement that is an organ to itself. In adults, we only find red marrow in the skull, vertebrae, ribs, sternum, part of the pelvic girdle, and the proximal heads of the humerus, which is your upper arm, and the femur, which is your thigh. Yellow marrow is found in adults, and most red marrow turns into fatty yellow marrow and no longer then produces blood. Bone development. Ossification or osteogenesis is the formation of bone, and there are two ways that our body does it, depending on the type of bone. We can have intramembraneous ossification and endochondral ossification. Intramembraneous ossification produces the flat bones of the skull and of the clavicle, which is your collarbone. These bones develop within a fibrous sheet similar to epidermis of the skin and sometimes therefore are called dermal bone. Mesenchyme. This is an embryonic connective tissue that condenses into a layer of soft tissue with dense supply of blood capillaries. You then have the cells differentiating into osteogenic cells. Now you know that osteogenic cells then will lead to osteoblasts, which are bone forming cells, correct? So basically, these osteogenic cells start forming from these mesenchymal cells, and then they form 
osteoblasts. They differentiate into osteoblasts. And these cells then start depositing organic matter or osteoid tissue. As these trabeculae grow thicker, calcium phosphate starts to be deposited in the matrix. So we have just basically all these different things coming in, being deposited, and starting to form bone. So the mesenchyme close to the surface of the trabecula remains uncalcified, and this becomes denser and more fibrous, and then forms that fibrous outside, which we call the periosteum. But inside, the osteoblasts continue to deposit minerals, producing a honeycomb of bony trabeculae, and some persist as permanent spongy bone. We then see some osteoclasts coming in to basically help uh, remodel and to form a marrow cavity in the middle of the bone. Because remember, the osteoclasts are the ones that dissolve bone. The trabeculae at the surface continue to calcify until the spaces between them are filled in, converting spongy bone to compact bone. This gives rise to the sandwich-like arrangement of mature flat bone. Here is a picture basically saying what I just read but with pictures. So in one, we have the condensation of mesenchyme into a soft sheet permeated with blood capillaries. In two, we see a deposition of osteoid tissues by osteoblasts on mesenchymal surface and an entrapment of the first osteocytes and the formation of the periosteum. In number three, we see a honeycomb of bony trabeculae formed by continued mineral deposition, creation of spongy bone. And then we see the surface bone filled in by bone deposition, converting spongy bone to compact bone, and the persistence of spongy bone then solely in the middle layer. There was also a different type of ossification, and we called that endochondral. Now, if you see the word chondral, that may remind you of chondrocytes, which were the cells that we saw in cartilage. Hence, the name. So this is a process in which bone develops from pre-existing cartilage models. And it's a hyaline cartilage. And it usually begins around the sixth fetal week and continues until you are in your early 20s. And most of our bones develop by this process. So mesenchyme develops into a body of hyaline cartilage in location of future bone. It is covered with a fibrous perichondrium Perichondrium produces chondrocytes initially and later produces osteoblasts. Osteoblasts then form a bony collar around the middle of the cartilage model, and the former perichondrium is now considered to be the periosteum. There are two ossification centers in this process, the primary and the secondary. In the primary ossification center, chondrocytes in the middle of the model enlarge. The matrix between the lacunae are reduced to thin walls. Walls of this thin matrix ossify and block nutrients from reaching the chondrocytes. This means that they die and their lacunae merge into a single cavity in the middle of the model. Blood vessels penetrate the bony collar and invade the primary ossification center. This gives way to the primary marrow cavity, which forms from the blood and the stem cells filling this hollow cavity.
Here is a picture of that. So we have the formation of the primary ossification center, the bony column, collar, and the periosteum. And then we have this vascular invasion formation of the primary marrow cavity and the appearance of the secondary ossification center at the top. So once the blood vessels penetrate the bony collar and invade the primary ossification center, we have this primary marrow cavity, which is then formed from the blood and stem cells filling the hollow cavity. The stem cells then give rise to the osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts line the cavity and deposit osteoid tissue and calcify it. And a wave of cartilage death progresses toward the ends. Osteoclasts follow the wave, dissolving the cartilage remnants, enlarging the marrow cavity. The metaphysis is a region of transition from cartilage to bone at each end of the primary marrow cavity. We then see the secondary ossification center, which is created by chondrocyte enlargement and death in the ephesus which then becomes hollowed out by the same process, generating a secondary marrow cavity. This cavity expands outward from the center in all directions. Here is a picture of the secondary ossification centers and the marrow cavities. So here in the first photo, we have bone at birth with enlarged primary marrow cavity and the appearance of the secondary marrow cavity in one ephesus. Bone of child with epithelial plate at the distal end. And then the end of the adult bone with a single marrow cavity and the closed epithelial plate, marking that that bone can no longer grow in length. During infancy and childhood, the ephesus fill with spongy bone. Cartilage is limited to the articular cartilage, which covers each joint surface and to the epithelial plate. A thin wall of cartilage separating the primary and secondary marrow cavity and the epithelial plate will persist, persist through childhood and adolescence. It serves as a growth zone for bone elongation. But as I've mentioned, and here it says at the end, by the late teens or early 20s, all remaining cartilage in the epithelial plate is generally consumed. Therefore, this gap between the ephesus and the diaphysis closes. The primary and secondary marrow cavities will then unite into a single cavity and the bone can no longer grow in length. Again, here is another picture showing you the stages of the endochondral ossification. Remember, it starts as hyalin and then is slowly replaced with bone tissue. When the epithelial plate becomes an epithelial line, that means the bone can no longer grow in length. And that brings us to the close of our first lecture. Lots going on. Please reach out if you have any questions.